come back on oops, stage four. Um, we continue this in English now. Our, the next speaker is Peter Kern. Do you want to come up already? <laughs> um, Peter will talk about um, how music can predict the human machine future. And I'm really um, interested to know what it will be about, because from the title, that makes me really curious. <laughs> um, Peter is an American journalist and um, audiovisual artist. He writes at createdigitalmusic.com, which is a very uh, comprehensive uh, website. Um, <laughs> uh, in, recommended reading, and is co-creator of the open source MeBlib synthesizer. So, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so now I don't have to say who I am, which is great. We can get um, straight into it. I should say that I, I come from a music background. So we're at what seems to be kind of a technology conference. I'm sometimes accused by people, who, I was going to say people who don't know me, but also people who do know me, of, of being techie. But my background is really from music, and it actually really comes from non-electronic music. Uh, I was trained as a piano player. So I am very, very biased. I'm a very, very biased musician. One of the instructions that we got for Republica was, do not give a sales pitch. So I'm kind of breaking that rule because this whole talk really is sort of a sales pitch. It's, it's just a sales pitch for music. So we're in a really exciting place, being in Berlin and even being in Germany, in that this is a really special place for where music and technology come together. It's an extraordinary, just astounding number of musical engineers in this country and uh, unparalleled anywhere else in the world. I would say even unparalleled in the United States. And uh, just tons and tons and tons of talent. And those of us on the music side of things haven't always done a great job of communicating with the, the rest of the city, especially as this, this internet phenomenon has happened in Berlin. There's all kinds of conversations that could be happening between these two communities that often aren't. So, I'm doing what I always tend to do, which is being kind of an advocate for music and an advocate f not just for music as the music industry and listening to records and Spotify and all of those things, but really music creation and music performance as a way of understanding how our, how our culture works and how to design better for people, not just musicians, but for human beings. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about design and a little bit about culture. Design is a great word because, and it's a great example of what I'm, what I'm saying. You know, I, I taught at uh, Parsons, the new school for design while I was in New York, and um, talk a lot about the word design. And the word design has become synonymous with visual design. So unless someone says specifically sound design and they're talking about the explosions in a new movie or something, if you hear the word design, people almost immediately assume that's visual. At Parsons, when we said design, we meant visual design. Um, and you'll also hear people talk about how we live in a visual culture. I hear that phrase a lot. Well, we live in a visual culture. And maybe we're not so aware of, of sound. I don't believe it's true. And actually, I think part of what drives people to suggest that we live in a visual culture is that our culture is so sonic and the way that we relate to our environment is so rooted in sound that we take that for granted. It's, it's so important that we almost can't think about it. Um, so those are, those are the two things I'm going to kind of talk about today. But we're going to go back in time a little bit, 43,000 years ago to Slovenia. I have 30 minutes, so this means I'm now covering 43,000 years of history, or 20, in 20, about 20 minutes. It's not so good, but here's what I mean. And is anyone Slovenian or from a Slavic country? Okay. But if, if I would ask you how to, the right way to pronounce this if I is. But this is, the, this is a, a flute that we believe is about 43,000 years ago. Or we believe that it's a flute. It's a, it's a bone with two evenly spaced holes in it. And it's a fragment that was found in a cave in the mid-90s. There are a number of archaeological artifacts like this that are tens of thousands of years old. Uh, but this is the oldest. It appears to be from the Cro-Magnon period. And it really does seem to be a flute. 
So we think a lot about the first tools and the emergence of language in human beings as, as being things like I don't know, knives and, and bows and arrows and spears. But almost at the moment that language seems to appear in human beings, or even pre-human beings, Cro-Magnon, and the moment that, that these primates start making tools, they seem to start immediately making musical instruments. We're, there is some chance that this is not a flute, uh, the people who studied it figure that the odds are something in the millions to one that you would have two holes spaced in a way that produces this tuning. And actually, if you think about a, a basic flute, it's a fantastic design. It is exactly fitted to the size of your hand. There seems to even be the appearance of a thumb a hole on this particular artifact. So it's a hand-shaped industrial design, and it's also matched to the natural uh, physical properties of sound to the overtone series. So when we think about tools, we should think about how musical instruments relate to tools. And we'll come back to flutes in a, in a bit. A another piece of evidence, this is now going back to the future or the, the present. Um, another piece of evidence that we really live in a sound culture as well as a visual culture is uh, noise complaints. So this is from Wired Magazine in 2010. This is how important sound and noise are to all of us. Uh, in New York, we have this uh, phone line called 311 where you can dial up the city and you get the whole city. Uh, and you can complain about anything to this one number. And that's been around, I think, for about 10 years. This does not exist in Berlin. This is a New York, New York technology is, is geared toward complaining. So the question is, what do New Yorkers complain about? And, and what's, what's astonishing is, by far, the most common complaint is noise. That pink area in the center is noise. And that's even versus things like rodents. Maybe we gave up complaining about those. Um, you know, dirty sanitation problems, all these other things. People are most bothered by noise. So noise is a big part of the way that you uh, experience your environment. In fact, after today, you can try this experiment. Someone told me that they thought if they had to lose one sense, they'd rather lose their hearing and lose their vision. Of course, we really would prefer to keep everything. But watch people as you, as you walk around after the event today and look for people with headphones. Uh, sometimes it works if you're going toward them. It almost always works if you're behind them. But what you'll find is the people who don't wear headphones, like in the U-Bahn, they'll know when you're behind them. They'll actually turn around and they'll kind of see if you approach them. If they are wearing headphones, they won't see you. Not only will they not hear you, they won't be able to see you. And it's because we have such incredible location and a situational awareness based on sound that we're, we're really aware of who's around us uh, also, also through sound. So let's talk about how you can design around this natural sensitivity to sound and music. And, and now we go back to 19... 1920 in Russia, and uh, Leon Teremin. The Soviets uh, were working at the time on, uh, back to situational awareness, proximity sensors. They were doing research in how they could kind of figure out where people were. Um, and at the time, you know, electronics and radios and things were almost magical to people. We didn't really have a good way to relate to them using almost anything other than the knob. And Teremin, th through an accident and an incredibly simple circuit that uses uh, something called capacitive induction came up with something that turned into a musical instrument and it sounded like this for those of you who don't already know it so this is 1920 here we are in 2013 and we're still wrapping our heads around this what if we could relate to technology without touching it what if we could just use our natural gestures and muscles the best way to test that theory is to try to play music with that sensor. Now, Teremin, the inventor, played beautiful music. Even more beautiful was uh, the musician Clara Rockmore. So, Teremin has an unfortunate association with horror movies and science fiction. It's a spooky instrument people want to play on Halloween. But when you listen to Clara Rockmore, you might believe this is the most beautiful instrument of the 20th century.
So any of us who work in electronic sound, I think, have to be really humbled by Clara Rockmore. With all of our synthesizers and computers, um, here's a person who can make an electronic instrument sound not just half as good as a violin, but maybe even a bit better. This is the quality of a, of a human voice, which is something that Bob Moog always said he wanted to achieve with his synthesizers. Bob Moog created the keyboard instrument that was used in rock and all of these uh, other songs that you've likely heard. He wanted that synth to sound like a voice as well. So that was the analog technology in the 20s. It's hard, sorry, I hate to cut that off. Um, that was analog technology in the 20s. Um, the, amazing thing that happened at the beginning of the computer revolution was being able to teach the computer to make music. And it actually happened even before computers were really doing any kind of graphics. Um, the innovator who led this team was a guy named Max Matthews. So we're now in the United States in Princeton, New Jersey. He was working, leading a team at Bell Labs which uh, in the 50s and 60s came up with many, many of the in, um, innovations that we rely on today. And so uh, Max began with software called Music. This was how early this research was. He needed, a, he needed a name for the software he was writing that would allow you to make music with a computer. So he called it Music because nothing else did that. Um, so that, that's how early this was. And as soon as 1957, a computer made truly newly generated music for the first time. There had been some experiments with kind of series of beeps or alert, turn, alert tones, but in 1957, an IBM mainframe for the first time made real music. And that was pretty impressive. But working with people also at Bell Labs who were researching vocal synthesis, Max went on to do something even more impressive. So how many people have seen the last scene in the movie 2001? Okay, so how the computer, as he's being disconnected, um, he, you hear his kind of memory falling apart. And the last thing that he does is how sings this song called Daisy Bell. And the reason he sings that is the idea was that this evil computer was at some point kind of like a child computer <laughs> learning to sing. And the first song that any computer ever sang was this song, Daisy Bell. Actually, now, if you heard a dubbed version of the movie, I just learned this, the computer sings a different song. Like, I found a French dub where it sings some French song. But, but um, this, is, this is the song that it sings. We're going to hear it, actually, through a really wonderful piece that's more recent um, by a friend of, two friends of mine, Daniel Massey and Aaron Koblen, uh, reinterpreted, uh, created a piece of digital art kind of around this moment. But here's, that, here's what that sounded like. Primitive, but remember it's the early 60s. In 1962, the world heard a computer scene for the first time when an IBM 704 was programmed at Bell Labs to sing the song, Daisy Bell. Now, in 2009, the song has been recreated from more than 2,000 sound clips collected. I, I actually don't know how to advance the video on this, but, it, it, but anyway, it's worth researching Aaron's piece. Aaron goes back and recreates that song um, using, uh, using a human voices sort of crowdsourced to sing it again. Um, but I think this is a really important moment in how we related to computers. Because for the first time, we were able to make a computer do what we can do and, and be able to sing a song. And since then, digital synthesis and, and making music with computers has been really a fundamental part of, of what we do. Max's contributions may have been influential in other ways as well. By being able to produce music with a computer, Max was able to create a system of digital synthesis that impacted all kinds of signal processing, not only in music, but in almost every application in computers that would, that would come. So music was a good test, but it, it led to advances that expanded far beyond music. And um, it, some people even argue that the work that Max did influenced object-oriented programming. He came up with a system for his music software that divided sound into component parts, into little modules that you sort of interconnect. And um, some people actually attribute this to object-oriented programming and to the idea of being able to make a computer an extension of your own mind. 
where we can say with some certainty that music was part of that model is in the 1970s, the late 70s, in the Dynabook project at Xerox Park. So if Bell Labs dominated the 50s and 60s in computers, Xerox Park was probably the, the real hotbed of the, of the late 70s. Um, and somehow my font has cut off a little bit, but the two people here that I can quote are Alan Kay, which is a name you may know, and Adele Greenberg, which is a name you may not know, but uh, Adele, she was also really influential in the model that we now have of how we think about computers. Uh, on the left is something called the Dynabook. How many people have seen this before, the Dynabook? There was some pre it got a little bit of press around the iPad. So as early as the late 70s, people were saying, hey, what if we had this computer that instead of being big and clunky, looked like a tablet that was about the size of a book and had a screen where everything was graphical. And what they described was basically an iPad, a little bit more than the iPad when it first came out. And they had a prototype working in 1977, 78. Uh, Adele Greenberg is an interesting character, too, um, in that she helped develop the whole, if any of you are programmers, the whole model viewer controller idea and object-oriented programming, and she and Alan Kay and this team of incredible people. Um, what I found especially interesting researching this was that they returned to the idea of a musical instrument to measure how well this human computer interaction was working. And they said that they even used the flute, back to our 42,000-year-old model, they used the flute as the measure that would determine kind of whether this computer was working. So they wanted the, the computer to be as responsive and as expressive as a flute. Um, because remember at the time, and sometimes even now, you would kind of make an action on a computer and, and get a result several moments later, which is no good. So musical instruments make great ways of measuring any interactive system. If something feels as good as an instrument does, and any kid can pick up an instrument and, and make noises with it. It's a good indication that you're onto something and how that will feel to, to people doing all kinds of other things and not just music. Um, an, another way of looking at this interaction, aside from uh, gestures and, and this kind of means of extending your mind, is through drawing. Um, here's a couple of uh, other early examples. So before graphic tablets, informatique du CMAMI. So we we'll have your French over top of me. Tablette graphique d'un stylet et d'un mini ordinateur. Il était possible pour l'utilisateur de dessiner dans un espace tant fréquence des arcs, des formes d'ondes, des enveloppes et plein de paramètres pour faire de la génération de sons en temps réel. Le premier exemplaire de l'UPIC vu le jour en janvier 1977. So the composer Ioannis Zanakis uh, developed a system called the UPIC that translated tablet motions into sound and music. And this is, the, as soon as, this is as early as the late 70s. He started describing this idea as soon as the 60s. And Adobe, uh, I think just yesterday, was introducing their new idea of what to do with the tablet. Uh, but this is another instance where some musical applications predicted what would come. And we should, oh, oh, no, slides might be slightly out of order. Oh, no, no there's a reason I did this, because this is kind of closer to the... This is a more recent project, a student of Golan Levins at Carnegie Mellon in Pennsylvania. Here's another kind of, one of my favorite applications of this idea of being able to draw interfaces. And it's called sketch mu music, I think, sketch control. But using camera tracking and uh, interactive software, he's able to draw controls for, for music or other applications much like Zanakis did with, with his work. The, so these things kind of work as knobs and faders and things. And I think there's tremendous potential of the ability to kind of draw and sketch out new fluid interfaces in this way. The guys we saw earlier researching the UPIC team have developed for their part uh, their own software that uses arcs and curves to create, uh, well, really strange sounds. Um, but aside from the ability to make spooky sounds like this with weird looking geometric circles, part of the work that they're doing I think is evocative in that it shows us new ways of thinking about time and graphical space. So this software, Eonix, uses via JavaScript coded um, arcs and curves and things the ability to navigate time with big graphical elements, whether that controls music or visuals or uh, 
art performances and so on. Yeah, and spooky sounds. We all love spooky sounds. Um, another instance of musicians kind of being a, a bit ahead of the curve in thinking about gestural interfaces for music. Uh, two other examples. So if you think about the last 10 years, they've been dominated by some new interface paradigms. One is the, the Microsoft Connect and camera tracking. One is the uh, Nintendo Wii Remote. And I think one is the iPhone, iPad, multi-touch interface. Each of these were used experimentally by musicians before they were used in these mainstream applications. In fact, when people saw the Wii remote, a lot of people saw echoes of the 1987 interface, again by Max Matthews, the radio baton. And so here's Max again. Max, who was the first person ever to do digital synthesis in the 50s, continued to be an innovator in each decade leading up to his death only a couple of years ago. So uh, let me now play a little bit of the music for you. So this is the radio baton. It uses a combination of touch sensors and, and wireless sensors inside the actual mallets, which later were uh, extended to work in three-dimensional space. Here we see them working in 2D. But Max is doing more than just playing an instrument. He's also shifting the time of the music that he's playing. He's kind of conducting it with his hands. So you'll hear in a moment he's about to speed up. Now when Miyamoto uh, of oh, Nintendo... Speed up a little bit. Now he's speeding up. When Miyamoto of Nintendo stood up on the stage now and performed with note. the Mi remote, Wii remote for the first time, conducting, he was doing almost an almost identical experiment to what Max had done in 1987. And now I have to cut off Bach. This is horrible. Okay, but we're running out of time. Um, uh, uh, before the iPad, um, a group of researchers at a French company called Jazz Mutant developed a piece of hardware called the lemur. Um, and the lemur before the iPad became the first multi-touch hardware to be available to the public. Here's a couple of lemurs being used by the band Glitch Mob. And so that's why we have smoke everywhere. But all of the basic features of the iPad, including 10-finger touch control and multi-finger tracking, were on this hardware, the lemur, several years before the iPad came out. So part of what happened was the musical community already recognized what they saw, at the, even at the iPhone keynote. Everyone said, oh, that. I've seen that before. Now I can have that on my phone. I know what to do with that. So that's sort of a quick overview of the history of musicians being a little bit ahead of the curve on, on, on gestural interaction, touch interaction. Uh, why am I telling you all of this other than bragging about some people who I admire? Um, it's because I think there's probably some clues to the future of fluid interfaces in some of these interactions. So we live now in a world that has mountains and mountains of data. And the people need to be able to navigate all of this data if they're going to have any control over it at all. We know that big governments and big institutions will be able to mine this data. But whether individuals will do it seems dependent on whether we can create the kind of interfaces that are fluid enough for them to be able to, to navigate them. And because machines are so much a part of our life and uh, are taking on new forms and new parts of the world, new markets and new devices, we will be constantly testing whether our designs can hold up to the kind of expressive interaction that makes our machines satisfying to use for human beings. Um, I think that a lot of the work that musicians are doing now uh, can, can move in this direction. And uh, we actually had this conversation a few years ago at South by Southwest with Joy Montford, who had led the Yahoo Advanced Technology Group. Um, actually, we had the talk right after it was disbanded, which was an exciting moment. Um, but in, in, even in that time, musicians in particular have continued to ex explore three-dimensional interfaces that store lots and lots of information in some pretty expressive ways. This is a Canadian single developer who built something called Audio GL. And the music that you hear is actually being synthesized entirely in real time inside this three -dimension, crazy three-dimensional environment. And this is software that he's now made available to, to um, uh, early supporters and is, is using on his own. It's, it's already quite advanced. And it's, since we're running low on time, I'll say it's crazy and three-dimensional. Um, you've probably seen uh, 
other sorts of examples. This is a, a Connect-based example, which I'm going to kind of scroll ahead since I see the five minute mark. And so on. You've probably seen some of these kind of demos. Person using Connect to do uh, real-time interaction. What's great about music for this is how timing dependent music is, right? So if, as a musician, you don't want to hear any lag between when you move your arm and when you hear music. It's a great way to test the timing sensitivity of something like Connect is to get someone to try to play music with it. And in the case of Connect, I can tell you people have been very, very frustrated, actually. Um, so uh, it's exciting to see musicians get these leap units. If you've seen leap motion, it's sort of the next thing in gestural control, and test that in the same way. Uh, and moving in the opposite direction, I think another compelling possibility is, is the opposite of that. So we have lots of glass and touch and three dimensions. Uh, the other area that people in the music community are working is in uh, devices like the mono. And so now that we can embed computers in smaller and smaller forms for next to no money, we have the opportunity to rethink computers as something other than just screens. Um, the, Brian Crabtree and Kelly Kane, two sort of artists uh, from upstate New York, have done that with uh, the monom and then later with uh, another instrument called the arc. And these devices become kind of physical sculptures. Uh, and then finally, so I can take a couple of questions in our like last 60 seconds, <laughs> I'll say that it's also possible to put those two together. So here's a, a friend of mine who's based here in Berlin. Oh, the video's gone. Well, you take my word for it. Actually, let's take questions. Do we have time for a question? Or is, is there a question? I, you know, I love beer as a way of discussing, <laughs> uh, discussing these things, uh, and I will be around for the evening, so, you know, maybe the best thing to do is uh, meet me after the show, and thanks a lot. <laughs>